Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It is a real pleasure to be here today. So as said by the chair, I will present some uh, uh, kinetic models that, are, that have been developed uh, to study the spatial spread of uh, epidemics and analyze uh, the uncertainty uh, of data uh, through a, an appropriate uncertainty quantification method. This is a work that I have developed uh, at the Department uh, of Mathematics and Computer Science of the University of Ferrara at the beginning with Lorenzo Pareschi. And then future and so sorry, further developments have been um, developed together with other collaborators, uh, with Giacomo Di Marco, who is here, and uh, Walter Boscheri, and then uh, Liu Liu and Chua, and Shui Yushu. So uh, we we have seen that with the advent of COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of researchers started to work on epidemic models and uh, trying to propose some new um, mathematical models to study the evolution of the spread of this uh, uh, of this pandemic uh, in, with the um, methods that are increasingly suitable to, to study the features, the specific feature of this coronavirus. And most of these models that have been proposed for the COVID-19, to study COVID-19 or other, in any case, uh, infectious diseases are based on uh, the work made by Kermack and McKendrick, so a compartmental epidemiological models, uh, which are based on deterministic uh, ordinary differential equations, which describe the temporal evolution of the spread of the epidemic, neglecting the spatial component in favor of an assumption of homogeneity in, of, in, on the territory and on the population. And generally, this concept of the average behavior of a population is sufficient to, to have a, a first description of the evolution of a, an infectious disease. But uh, in practical applications, um, the, incl the inclusion of the spatial component becomes crucial, especially, of course, when there is the need to consider especially heterogeneous interventions. For example, in the case of the COVID-19, we can consider the initial, the initial the outbreak of the COVID-19 in which there, are, there was an heterogeneity in the spatial uh, spread of, of this virus. So we had to consider, for example, the government had to consider different actions in different locations to try to control the spread uh, and fight the, the spread of, of, this, of this virus. So, for example, I give you uh, uh, an example that is the Italian case. So in this figure here, uh, and of course, this is Italy, and uh, the dots are um, identifying the 33 Italian provinces that by April 5th, 2020, so basically one month and a half after the beginning of, of the, actually the discovery of the first uh, infected people in Italy, um, registered more than 1,000 infected subjects detect, detected. And uh, in this figure, uh, it has been overlapped the map of the four main highways in the north of Italy. And so you can really clearly see that effectively, at least at the beginning of this pandemic, the COVID-19 spread was following these pathways. And so it was like propagating in through these highways following the mobility of people. So some recent works have attempted to fill these gaps. And we can consider three main uh, approaches. The first one uh, consider is the meta-population network approach, which is still based on system of ordinary differential equations, uh, and the, which is, there are basically the, there is basically one system of ordinary differential equation for each location of interest that we want to consider, and then they build up a network. And there is a, a, a term that considers the mobility of people just just uh, from one location to the other. But this is still a system of, OD, of ODEs, and so we don't have any information of the special propagation of the epidemic along these pathways of communication. Then we can also consider, and this is widely 
used in literature an approach based on reaction diffusion systems, but uh, due to the parabolic nature of these models, we have a kind of unphysical feature that consists in, uh, um, in instantaneous propagation of the virus also over large distances due to the parabolic nature. And, and then finally, we can also consider an approach based on hyperbolic partial differential equations. That is what uh, I will consider during this talk. So another important aspect concerns, of course, since we are in a UQ, uh, in a Q workshop, concerns the uh, large uncertainty of uh, values reported by official resources. So any realistic data-driven model must consider this limitation. And uh, of course, if we consider, this is generally true for social sciences and if we consider epidemiological models, for example, for sure there is a large uncertainty in the um, initial number of, in the detected, in the number of infected individuals uh, detected and reported by official sources. So, for example, again, uh, looking at Italy, uh, here we have in this plot the number of detected COVID-19 cases since the beginning of the, since the discovery of the first infected people in Italy uh, till basically the, the further year. And on the other, on the other side here, there is uh, the number of uh, deaths due to the COVID-19. And so if you have a look at the first two waves that impacted the, the Italian country, we see that in terms of death, the two waves seems to have a kind of similar magnitude. But this is not the case if we have a look at the number of detected COVID-19 cases. Indeed, we can absolutely we can surely assume that during the first wave due to the to the testing policies uh, we were for sure losing a huge number of infected cases and so undercounting the number of uh, infectious people so uh, of course uh, you, you already know it but in certain in presence of uncertainties it is necessary to quantify the effect of these uncertainties uh, in in the effects uh, in the, in the modeling and so um, the UQ task consists uh, and we know it, but just to just a little remind, uh, giving uh, cons considering and obtaining statistics about the output of interest that depend on the, the solution of our uh, system of equations it can be ODEs or PDEs. In our case, with the PDEs, given the statistics about the uncertain inputs, and so when we choose to transmit this statistical information to the problem, our um, our um, and, and we consider different possible uncertain inputs in in this framework, uh, which are independent one to the other, Z1 till Zdz, which can be collected into a single vector Z here in red. Uh, the solution of the system will not only depend, of course, on space and time, but also on this random vector, which characterizes the possible random inputs. So the, the simplest case that we can consider for, to describe the spread of an epidemic is through the compartmental SIR model that, it, that has been uh, introduced by Kerma Kemekendis, as I said at the beginning. So in this model, we consider that uh, the population is divided in three compartments. The first one is a compartment of susceptible people, which might contract the disease, and then another compartment that, is, that are the infected people, so people that are infected and can infect also others. And then uh, the last compartment, that is the compartment of removed people that are removed like by the, in the game, but in, into the, from the game, um, because uh, are either healed and immune or unfortunately deceased. And we have two parameters, two epidemic parameters in this model, which is the simplest model that we can consider. And uh, this is the transmission rate, which governs the, mm, the, 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 the infectious rate. So, And also the uh, recovery rate, which is the inverse of the infectious period. So um, we, we can uh, write this system of ordinary differential equation like this. And so you see that there is this Forcing theorem, which um, describes the passage from the S compartment to the I compartment, and then this term governs the, 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 the movement from the I compartment to the R, co R compartment of the, uh, of the individuals. And we conserve the mass. If we sum all the terms, we, we see that we conserve the mass uh, with this system. So 
if we want, if we consider a stochastic framework in which the initial conditions are affected by uh, a random input Z that uh, we, and we assume to know the probability density function of this random input, we can assume that, for example, the initial conditions of the infectious uh, compartment is, uh, um, uh, is affected by this random input in a sense that if we have a nine naught that is a lower bound, that is the amount of reported detected cases, and then an uncertainty that uh, that describes a, a bound that get, starts from this lower uh, band to uh, up. And um, so we can, in this very simple case, we can evaluate the solution uh, of the system analytically, obtaining the initial exponential phase of growth of, uh, of uh, infected people that depends on these uh, random parameter. And then we can also evaluate some statistics like the expectations of the number of infected people that will, which uh, will just, um, will just uh, lead to uh, and a solution in which the Z is just replaced by the uh, average of the random parameter. Yeah. Yes. Sure, it doesn't depend on Z. And it's not just the total population. Yes, minus. actually, yes, it should be like this. Uh, this is just a very, very simple case to explain how we introduce it. But yes, of course, it will depend on it because uh, just for mass conservation at the beginning, we consider the R is zero. And then also as now would be just. Uh, uh, the total population minus I0 and R0, which is zero. Yes, but it's just, just a very, very simple, very simple case. So, um, what we propose is something that at the beginning still considered the sentence compartmentalization in terms of epidemic models, so that is the SIR compartmentalization, but we added the special ingredient, as I said, plus the uncertainty of, uh, uh, of, uncertainty of inputs. So we consider indeed uh, that for each compartment of this model, there are two subgroups of people. One moving in a one-dimensional domain with positive direction and velocity plus lambda, and the other subgroup moving in negative direction with min velocity minus lambda, which can be different for each compartment as we see. And then uh, this, uh, so we can see that in this uh, system of governing equations, we have the transport terms. And then also we have the relaxation terms here that depend on the relaxation times. So and we can see from here that these model uh, highlights its roots in the discrete velocity, velocity kinetic theory. Because if we just neglect these three, th these terms here that are the uh, epidemic terms, <laughs> just given by the SIR model, okay, just not just consider that they are not there. We see that for each uh, compartment, we are just describing, we are just uh, um, following uh, the Ghost and Taylor model of discrete velocity, the kinetic theory. Of course, we are in epidemic, and so we need to consider also these forcing terms, these uh, epidemic terms here. So we have, again, the term that uh, this uh, gamma parameter that is the recovery rate. And then we have an incident function here that depends on the transmission rate, which is uh, exactly the same that we have seen previously for the SIR or the model, plus another damping parameter k here that acts like a damping coefficient in the incident function due to the awareness of people related to the risk of uh, of the epidemic is given by the epidemic so both these parameters may vary both in space and time uh, the beta parameter the transmission rate may vary in time due to the any space due to the different uh, control actions uh, put in uh, place by the government and the k uh, parameter can vary due to the um, uh, the, the actions that are just taken from yes sorry can you say what the movement, the motion is, so, so the people are moving? Or, uh, yes, we, you we consider uh, just a one-dimensional uh, structure of the domain. And so we consider that people can either move from uh, in one direction or in the opposite direction in this domain. Like a high periodic particle. For example, like the highway. So uh, 
Yes, we like like we consider that there are two then particle densities. Like, okay, uh, one particle density will move with positive direction in in this domain, and then the other particle density will move in the opposite direction. But there are these particle densities are this couple each of, uh, of particle density are just uh, um, characterizing. Each couple or the, the each compartment. So that is, is really a spatial variable and yes. affected and so uh, SIR. This is a linear, linear in, in a linear um, movement in space, and uh, then there is this relaxation term here, which defines the collision of this, so the interaction of these two different people okay. density of people that are moving with the opposite direction and so that there is the probability of changing direction once yes, they uh, they you. meet yes the, the uh, it conditions. could be extended to a, a ring and then you have more compartments and with a periodic boundary condition yes exactly actually um we, we can actually use the boundary condition that we prefer here like not flux boundary conditions, periodic boundary conditions, it depends, but we extend it to one network approach. I will, I will take, I will tell you. Um, yes, so this is, uh, so if we, as done uh, generally in kinetic theory, we can describe, define the fluxes for each compartment that are these ones here. And if we use this definition plus the definition of the total densities, sorry that I didn't say that here, and we put we use this definition into the system of governing equation, we can obtain an equivalent macroscopic form. Uh, it is the, an hyperbolic model just underlying a macroscopic formulation of, this, of the system written in mesoscopic form that we have just seen in the previous slide. So we have uh, still six uh, um, equations and three for the densities and three for the fluxes. What it is more interesting to notice is that if we um, define the diffusion coefficients uh, as here, so the lambda squared time, and we analyze the behavior of this model uh, in the zero relaxation limit, so as the tau parameters tend to, tend to zero while uh, keeping finite these diffusion coefficients, which means that the velocities are tending to infinity, infinite. Um, we enter into the stiff regime of this uh, system of equation, and we, uh, from the last three equations that were the equations of the fluxes, we recover fixed lows, which inserted into the first three equations of the density lead to this reaction diffusion system that is widely used in literature with the, uh, the still this SIR compartmentalization, so uh, with this parabolic term here. So from this point, we can understand that the scaling parameters, so the relaxation time and the uh, velocity and the speeds of the um, uh, characteristic speeds of the com of the of the individuals, um, may um, change the uh, the behavior of the solution, which can either result hyperbolic for more relaxation time and finite speeds, or parabolic when the relaxation time tends to zero and the, propagate, the, the characteristic velocity is just tend to infinity. And this is a kind of very interesting feature of the model that we propose because it permits us to describe in a more realistic way the movement of human beings, which is characterized by uh, movements at different scales. Indeed, we, can, we, can, we will assume um, a multi-scale situation in which in highly densely populated zones, the system will recover a diffusive regime because the, 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 the spread of the epidemic will be diffused in parabolic in a diffusive way. Uh, while in all the main arteries um, linking one city to the other, one location, highly densely um, populated to, uh, location to the other, we will assume a hyperbolic regime, a hyperbolic configuration of these scaling parameters, which will avoid to obtain uh, the, um, the, the some physical feature of propagating at uh, uh, infinite speed this information along these arteries of communication. So uh, just to give you an example of the two regimes that we can, uh, uh, we can simulate with this model, here I'm just considering a test, very, very simple test case in a one-dimensional domain in which there is an initial seed of infected people with a Gaussian distribution in the domain and um, an heterogeneous uh, transmission rate beta 
uh, in a deterministic setting. And uh, from in this plot, we are considering a hyperbolic regime of the scaling parameter, and in this other on the right, we are considering a parabolic regime. And you can effectively see that if we consider a hyperbolic regime, the spread we see that the transport mechanism indeed with the with a spread of the infectious disease that is kind of controlled. And while if we use a parabolic regime, the, the virus just spreads uh, very fast uh, in the whole domain. So we can enrich our model and we can add, for example, other compartments that are um, increasingly suitable to study the specific features of the infectious disease that we want to investigate. Since we wanted to investigate the, the outbreak and study the outbreak of COVID-19, we considered the addition of other two compartments. In particular, we considered that before uh, people being uh, infectious, they are exposed to the virus, so infected, but not yet infectious. So, and then we distinguish in between severely symptomatic people, the eye compartment, and uh, asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic uh, um, infected people. And this choice was made because uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 tests uh, that were the policy of COVID-19 tests at the beginning of the pandemic uh, that were made at, uh, in Italy at least, uh, we can consider the, that, the num that the detected people were surely just from be belonging to this compartment here. So we're showing re really severe symptoms and asymptomatic people were just lost, completely lost. Then we, of course, we need to add other uh, parameters in our model, like the incubation rate, the probability of developing severe symptoms to distinguish in between the recovery rate of the A compartment uh, and the I compartment, and also to distinguish in between the uh, incident function of the two compartments where so the, the susceptible can be infected either by uh, asymptomatic people or uh, severely symptomatic uh, infected people. And, but more interestingly, what we added to this uh, extension is the fact that we don't have anymore only two subgroups of people for each compartment. So we do not consider only two uh, um, commuting uh, groups that are moving with the opposite direction in, in our domain, but also an additional group of non-commuters, which prevents mass migration effects, which are uh, totally unrealistic. Indeed, we know that the majority of people will just lay in their origin location without moving over large distances, just commuting people that are moving for work or for studies will, uh, will move in their domain. And so we can write the dynamics of commuters exactly in the same way that have, we have seen for the SIR compartmentalization. Of course, there are more equations because we consider more, uh, more compartments, but believe me, it's exactly the same thing that we have done. And, uh, and then again, as we have seen previously, if, I'm sorry, of course, this, in this case, we need to couple this and close this system of equation with another, with the system of equation related to the non-commuting people. And, but in this case, since they are just, that, this is just a stationary population, uh, this is the, 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 the evolution of this part of the, you know, this part of the population would just follow an ODE model with the same compartmentalization that we have uh, considered for the, the dynamics of commuters. And as I said at the beginning, we are in a, considering a stochastic framework in which the Z uh, vector characterizes possible sources of uncertainty. As we have seen previously, we can write again the system in macroscopic form, just in, in uh, defining the fluxes for each uh, for each compartment, as we exactly as before, and then uh, defining the diffusive coefficients in the same way and analyzing the zero relaxation limit of, of this model. We can uh, we can recover again a reaction diffusion system. So again, a, a multi-scale nature of, of this model which can either result hyperbolic or parabolic based on the setting of this uh, scaling parameter. Then, considering the spatial, net, the spatial domain, uh, we want, it is possible to extend this, this method, method uh, to network approach, to a network approach like the one used in traffic models, chemotaxis models, or even blood flow models, for example. And so to consider a network composed of nodes uh, in a one-dimensional domain still, 
consider that nodes of the network are identifying locations of interest, which can be municipalities, provinces, regions, depending on the scale we want to analyze. And the arcs connecting each node to the others represent the ensemble of pathways linking, uh, sorry, in which the commuters are, are traveling and moving from one city to the other. So the epidemic state of each node will evolve in time, influenced by the mobility of this part of the population, which will travel along these arcs, and uh, always considering, in any case, a part of the individuals that will never le leave the origin node. And uh, the, the human problem that arises at each arc node interface can be uh, easily solved by employing a uh, Riemann invariance or the system that are just the kinetic, um, kinetic um, variables of the system and imposing suitable uh, conservation conditions at the interface, in this case, just the conservation of fluxes and of the mass of the total population. So, uh, so we are dealing, we are in a stochastic framework, we are in a multi-scale framework, so we had to consider an appropriate numerical method to solve this problem. And uh, we considered a second order implicit explicit runge kuta final volume collocation method, which guarantees a stochastic asymptotic preservation property. So there are two main ingredients. The first one is the stochastic collocation method, and we chose this method, and we, I know that you all know it, but we chose this method because of two main advantages. This is a non-intrusive method, so it permits us just to evaluate the solution uh, in, with, in a deterministic setting in each, at each collocation point. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, with, with respect to like a Monte Carlo method, it has a pseudo-spectral convergence, an exponential convergence rate because it reflects the high accuracy of generalized polynomial chaos approaches. So in the, uh, in the stochastic space, if the solution is sufficiently smooth in, in this space, stochastic space, uh, the, the, the convergence rate can be exponential and it permits us to preserve this accuracy also in the diffuse state limit. So if we have a method that uh, the deterministic the deterministic method at each collocation point that is asymptotic preserving, uh, we will have a stochastic asymptotic preservation uh, property guaranteed. When I talk about asymptotic preservation, I just consider that uh, the, our scheme permits us to be consistent uh, uh, with the nature of the solution also in the diffusive regime, that is the stiff regime that we have seen, and uh, it permits us to choose the uh, time step of the method independently of the smallness of the scaling parameter tau in our case. So indeed, to evaluate the solution at each collocation point, we have considered an implicit explicit runge kuta scheme with a final volume discretization in, in space. Um, both in, in time and space, we have a second order. Uh, in space, we have reached the second order uh, using a total variation diminishing approach, like a standard one with a minimum slope limiter for the reconstruction of boundaries of, of the variables. And, and we have chosen an IMAX from a Kuta scheme that, that guarantees us the, 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 the asymptotic preservation property need because we are dealing with a multi-scale uh, system of equation. So, just a very brief <laughs> review, I mean, of the stochastic collocation method. We consider for, to apply this method, we need to know the probability density function uh, of the random input. So we assume that we know it. And for example, we can consider it has a uniform distribution, but can be, for example, also Gaussian distribution. So the solution of the stochastic problem can be comp computed employing a generalized polynomial chaos expansion for which the uh, approximate solution is obtained as a series of uh, orthogonal polynomials with uh, or polynomials or orto orthonormal with respect to the PDF. And uh, um, it, the, the, the expansion coefficients can be evaluated with this integral that in the stochastic collocation framework is can be replaced with the appropriate quadratic so we can evaluate the solution considering n collocation points, zn, and corresponding weights, omega n. And so we can clearly see from this that indeed we have everything that we need just evaluating the solution at each, the deterministic solution at each collocation point. 
And then further post-process the result, we obtain our statistics like the expectation uh, of the variables of, of interest and then consequently also the variance. So to show you uh, an application, like we considered a um, real um, epidemic uh, scenario. Uh, so the outbreak of COVID-19 in Italy. Uh, in Italy, uh, the, the first uh, detected cases were in this region, that is the Lombardy region, where Milano is, Milan is. And so we built up our network, considering the five city, uh, the cities that have been majorly affected by the virus uh, at, the, at the beginning of this pandemic. In particular, in this region, the, the first detected cases were in this province and then following also in, in this other province that are two small, smaller provinces of, of this region. And um, we consider, of course, the arcs connecting each city to the other to consider the mobility path uh, of people and to um, assign the, um, the, the number of commuting people and also the coefficients that evaluate how many people are entering one city or going into the other. We use national assessment mobility flows uh, given by, by the region uh, we were analyzing. In particular here, there is the so-called commuters matrix in which we have basically the percentage and the amount of people that day by day, day, by day uh, move from one location to the other. Just to let you, uh, just to let you observe, uh, this important thing is that, the important thing is that um, you see that Lodi and Cremona, that are these two smaller cities, are, have the, the larger amount of people that are commute, commuting day by day and just leaving the city to go for work, for studies in the other bigger cities of this network, of, of this domain, uh, which are uh, for sure Milan, and then Bergamo and, and Brescia. And then, uh, as I said before, we considered a, a hyperbolic, hyperbolic configuration of the scaling parameters in the arcs and a diffusive configuration of the scaling parameters in, in, the, in the nodes. Then we had to calibrate, of course, this model. And I don't want to bother you with these details. Maybe it's not interesting in this context. But I just want to highlight it that, that it has been a kind of delicate task. Um, and uh, we try to fix as many parameters as possible that are said to be the clinical ones with a clinical meaning, but still some parameters had to be calibrated like the transmission rate. And, uh, and um, we finally uh, end up with an initial reproduction number estimated to be uh, um, 3.6 in Italy that is in line with the literature estimations. We have just uh, we have implemented the, um, the, 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 the scaling of uh, the governmental restrictions have been implemented, of course, varying the transmission rate and also the damping, this K coefficient, the damping coefficient. And also we have changed the number of commuters people along this simulation because we had, uh, luckily, uh, Google, the Google just um, made available uh, some uh, mobility GISP data uh, that track by GPS systems of the people uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So uh, more interestingly, we consider, of course, a source of uncertainty, just a very simple setting actually, with uh, introducing a random parameter Z with a uniform distribution, which affects the initial condition uh, of the um, infected people, the rarely infected people in this case, with I naught, that is the, num the lower bound of this uncertainty, is represented by the number of effectively detected cases, but still, which are were considered to be uh, undercounted. And of course, we had to evaluate the initial conditions of uh, the exposed individuals and the asymptomatic individuals, which are, which are kind of unknown. To do so, we basically solved backward the problem, starting with a situation in which there is only one infected, expo sorry, exposed people. And then we went further, we solved further um, on to obtain, to till the moment in which we obtained the number of uh, detected people and verified so the number uh, the corresponding number of exposed and asymptomatic people in that moment uh, for the initial condition but of course also the uh, the initial condition of exposed individuals symptomatic in individual or mainly symptomatic individuals and uh, symptomatic individuals are stochastic as, as we said previously and also the uh, transmission rate uh, is said to be 
uh, answer. So first of all, jumping to the results, uh, the, um, the first thing I want to show is the convergence study that we have made, just to um, show you that it has exactly the uh, exponential convergence that we were um, expecting, the method. So this is the error in terms of L infinity, but it's the same also in terms of L2, L1, it is still in a, an exponential convergence as we increase the number of stochastic collocation points uh, in our method. This is valid for both expectation and variance in two different cities of our network with respect to the two different um, variables, infected people, infected uh, compartments. Then? Just one deep, one parameter only. Yes, yes. just one. Uh, one. Uh, uh, we just switch collocation points. Uh, yes, for yes. just one, yes, just one randomly. Yes. So the which collocation points? Uh, At the end, we decided to use five collocation points for this, for this simulation. The previous plot. Yes. So we use for this simulation, we use two collocation points and then we and use. Gauss Legendre? No, so uh, yes, Gauss Legendre, because we use a unit, we consider a unit for distribution of the random inputs. So we, got, we consider Gauss Legendre. And then, so um, here uh, we can see uh, the, the expected, uh, uh, the expectation of the uh, infected individuals, so in terms of uh, exposed, uh, severely symptomatic, asymptomatic, or weirdly symptomatic people, um, expectations and 95% confidence intervals for each node, for each city of our network, and also for the whole Lombardy network. We can see that effectively the, the model is able to capture the heterogeneity of the spatial spread of the epidemic. Indeed, as I said before, the spread, the, the virus started to spread from these two cities, but after one month, due to the mobility of people, the majority of the virus is concentrated in the uh, bigger uh, cities <coughs> of the network. We, we can also compare the uh, confidence uh, bands uh, and expectations with respect uh, to uh, the um, cumulative number of severely symptomatic people with the data reported by, by the civil protection department in Italy. And we can see that effectively the, um, these dots that are the observed data, the, the, the detected number of affected people, cumulative way lay in the lower bound of the um, of the numerical uh, results. But of course, if we consider not only the severely symptomatic people, but also the huge amount of people that were totally uh, um, not seen in these dynamics, we see that uh, the effective, the, the real, the, the expected number of total infected people in the domain is much higher than these dots that are exactly the data that we get. So, to just to conclude this talk in this uh, final min in these final minutes, I just want to um, briefly uh, say some extensions that we have made. Um, this first one concerns an extension uh, for two-dimensional geographical settings that have been uh, done together with Walter Boschieri and Giacomo Di Marco. And so it is possible to extend uh, these uh, these models uh, to real geographical uh, domains. And in, still, in this case, considering a fully kinetic transport model in which we consider um, velo continuous velocity in space. And so one person can uh, move with a velocity that is in kind of a circle uh, with respect to the X position that is occupying. Everything that we have seen for the um, discrete velocity model uh, can be uh, done and ev evaluated also for this two-dimensional model. Uh, we have used this model to evaluate the spread not only in of the COVID-19, not only in the Lombardy region, but also in the Emilia-Romagna region, that is the city where, where lays the, the city here of Ferrara, uh, where I work. And... Um, we have considered, again, a different uh, um, distribution of the scaling parameters, in particular here of the, um, of the, co the co um, characteristic velocities of, of the compartments, kind of reproducing, again, a sort of network to permit the people to move exactly along the real pathways of communications of these cities. 
and still considering a part of the population, a majority actually of the population that is non-commuting in this domain. And so we'll just remain at the origin node for the whole simulation. And this is a kind of an example that you can, can that uh, Walter and Giacomo and Lorenzo obtained for the Emilia Romagna region, and which we can effectively see the special propagation of this virus along the artery of communication. Then the second extension that we have uh, recently made uh, is in terms of a uh, UQ method. Indeed, as I said, to employ the uh, stochastic collocation method, we need to know the probability density function, but it is interesting to use but when we, we need to um, uh, evaluate comparisons with experimental data, it is interesting to consider also UQ methods that do not uh, uh, necessarily require an a priori knowledge of the probability density function. And to do so, uh, we, we see, we know that bi fidelity or multi fidelity methods can alleviate these limitations through an adoption of uh, contravariate techniques, which are based on an appropriate choice of a surrogate low fidelity model, which is used to uh, inform the selection of the collocation node, be, nodes, basically, uh, for the evaluation of the high fidelity model in which we majorly rely on. And so to, together with Liu Liu and Shou Yu Xu, we have uh, developed and, and proposed a bifidelity collocation method, uh, considering as high fidelity model a one-dimensional kinetic trans mo transport model with the full velocity range, so continuous in, in the velocity space, and a low fidelity model with the two discrete velocities for the low fidelity model. This is the kind of solution that we can obtain if we consider a domain that is, that cons that is composed by three different no regions. The first one is here, the second one is in the middle, and the third one is here, more or less. Uh, people interact with one to the other and can move in this domain. And we can, uh, you see that the blue uh, solution is the low fidelity solution, while the red solution is the high fidelity solution, both in an intermediate regime and in a hyperbolic regime. In both cases, we see that the low fidelity solution in the physical space behaves much differently with respect to uh, the high fidelity solution, but still the bifidelity method is in line with the high fidelity uh, with the high fidelity uh, line. Uh, this is because in the terms of the parameter space, the two models share similarity. This is why it works. And this is a crucial point of this kind of problems. And so we, we could use just a few uh, evaluations of the high fidelity model uh, informed, properly selected, uh, given the information that we obtained with a huge, kind of huge evaluation of, low fidel of the low fidelity model. So uh, just to conclude, we would like to further extend this model to take into account also the age structure of the population, which is an essential feature to study ep epidemics like COVID-19, for example, and also the viral load. Uh, related to, to the infectious disease. And then we would, of course, like to extend this model to include also vaccination people, vaccinated people. And we recently actually also developed asymptotic, an asymptotic preserving physics informed neural network framework um, to evaluate uh, both. Uh, uh, to estimate the, the modeling parameters and also to forecast some epidemic scenarios in a multi-scale way. So considering that uh, still the asymptotic preservation property is fundamental if we want to obtain physically consistent uh, predictions and uh, reconstructions. And uh, this is a kind of example that we have obtained. Uh, we are finalizing this preprint together with Chuan Lu and Shou Yushu. And we would like to further extend this approach with real epidemic data sets and also include Yuku uh, also here. And with this, I thank you. And these are the main references uh, related to the work I have presented. <laughs>